Hello, glad to see you on my channel. I really value it. And today I want to share with you a wonderful story. It's a dramatic story that will come as a total shock to everybody. It is a really amazing story. So enjoy watching it. Little John was sitting on the bench looking at Parsersby. And there were a lot of them. Some were strolling leisurely through the park. Some were hurrying somewhere. A motley, colorful crowd. There were children in the park, both big and big like John. There were adult mothers, fathers, grandmothers, and grandfathers holding hands tightly. John came to the park with his mother, too. Before that, they had a long, long train ride. For the boy, it was his first trip. He had never before seen such huge, writhed, in heat iron cars that smelled so strange but pleasant. At the train station, he was even frightened at first sight. What are you, a girl? Uncle Alexander grinned, noticing how John recoiled from the train. And your mother said she gave birth to a boy, Uncle Alexander. John couldn't stand that loud, perpetually unshaven, angry man. His mother, on the other hand, seemed to love him. She hugged him, kissed him, stroked his head, and tried to please him in everything. John did not understand. Well, what could be found pleasant in this man? When Uncle Alexander first appeared in his and his mother's apartment, at first he even liked the boy, because he came with cake, candy, juice, and flowers. It became like a holiday for the Yuzhama. And John loved holidays. The man stayed to live with them in their small apartment with creaky floors and wide windowsills. John adored his house, so old, so familiar, wooden two stories, neighbors who had always been kind to the boy. He didn't understand why the adults called the place old, that it was long overdue for demolition. Why? Because it's such a wonderful place to live. It's the best place in the world. One day John told his neighbor, his old lady Clava, who often talked to the curious little boy and gave him something tasty to eat. She laughed so hard that she had tears in her eyes, and then for some reason she became sad and hugged John tightly. Baba Clava is good, very kind. The boy missed her on this trip, although he liked his first ever Baba Clava adventure. Uncle Alexander didn't like him either. She called him a tyrant an alcoholic, and a worthless man. John did not know exactly what all these words meant, but by the way the neighbor said them, he knew it was something very bad. And the boy agreed with Baba Clava. When Uncle Alexandra appeared in their apartment, her former friends and friends stopped visiting her mother. And that was good because they sat in the kitchen all night long, laughing, making noise, often arguing, and even fighting. At times like that, John would crawl under the bed, afraid he would get hurt, too. It was scary and unpleasant, and Uncle Alexander would pull everyone away. Calm reigned in the house, but unfortunately not for long. The man was much worse than his mother's friends. He swore at my mother, and John was constantly displeased with something, demanding total obedience. And then people started coming to the apartment again. Only now Uncle Alexander's friends were as sullen and angry as he was. John was afraid of them, very afraid. He felt that these people might hurt him or his mother. Sometimes Uncle Alexander would kick John out of the apartment with words. Go for a walk. Already got it and locked the door with the key. The boy tried to explain that it was cold or raining outside that he would sit like a mouse in his room and not disturb anyone. But Uncle Alexander was adamant, and his mother agreed with him about everything. So the boy crouched for hours in the deserted yard. It was good if Baba Clava met him and took him to her place. The old lady's apartment was clean. It always smelled good. And though John loved his home, looking at Baba Clava's bright rooms, Babe understood that their apartment was constantly in chaos. Her neighbor didn't have empty bottles lying in the corners, and there was no dust, dirt, or garbage on the floor. There were bookcases along the walls. John liked to look at pictures. Baba Clava even began to teach him how to read in them. 
the boy was already putting letters into words. It was like magic. Inexplicable squiggles suddenly made quite concrete sense. But the learning process had to be interrupted. We're leaving here tomorrow, Mom announced one day. I'm already packed. There's not much to gather. Uncle Alexander came hoarsely from the next room. Where are we going? John asked. To a better life, Mom answered vaguely. Somewhere where things will be very different. That night, John could not sleep. The excitement in his little head got in the way. He's dreamed so many thoughts, his heart settled in anticipation of a miracle. Something special was about to happen. Something completely new. The uncertainty was a little frightening. But nevertheless, the change was pleasant. In the morning, John barely managed to shake me awake. Get up quickly or we'll leave. And you stay here, Uncle Alexander yelled, looking at his mother's unsuccessful attempts to lift her sleepy son off the couch. John immediately jumped up. He knew Uncle Alexander wasn't kidding or scary. He really could do this. He would do it. The train station greeted the boy with a motley gamut, a beggar, crowds of people. John held tightly to his mother's hand. His hands were busy with the bags. The little boy was very afraid of getting lost in this endless sea of people. A train was coming, bright and threateningly puffing, skinny like Baba Clava's red-hot iron. This was the first time the boy had ever seen a real train. No, of course not. There were pictures of trains in Baba Clava's books, but it was one thing to see an illustration and another to see such a machine in person. The train frightened and delighted at the same time. Let's go, Mom agreed, and headed for the train. Inside was even better than John had imagined. Uncle Alexander and his mother sat on the lower shelves, and he was put on the top shelf. From there it was very comfortable and interesting to watch the life of the car. And what were the views from the window? John even stopped talking for a few hours, something that didn't happen to him very often. Forests, fields, villages passed by. It turned out that the world was so vast, so beautiful. How I would love to walk in those groves and throw stones in the glimpses of rivers and lakes behind the window. And sometimes passing by on the neighboring tracks were oncoming trains, passenger and freight trains. The most interesting ones were the ones carrying machinery. John liked the pounding of the wheels. It was soothing, promising adventure and joyous encounters. When it got dark outside the window and his mother told her son to go to bed, John lay listening to that peaceful sound. In the morning, John was awakened by a long train whistle. At first the boy didn't even realize where he was and got a little scared. Then he remembered everything, smiled, weighed his head down, made sure that his mother and Uncle Alexander were nearby, sleeping on the lower shelves. He calmed down and stared out the window again. The train was rushing through an unusually scenic area. The scenery was mesmerizing. It made the tiny heart clench with delight. John felt a sudden urge to take his sketchbook and pencils and try to draw this beauty. Only, only he didn't have a sketchbook or pencils. All this was left at Baba Clava's. It was she who gave him these things. And Mom and Uncle Alexander thought that it was not necessary to pamper children, and that a child of four was still not able to draw. After a while, all three adults woke up, took their time, ate some bread and sausage, drank tea from the silver teacups. It was very tasty. And then the boy was ordered to climb back to the top shelf. And to sit quietly there, Uncle Alexander warned him. Otherwise, he'll notice you and take your ticket away. You're a hare. John was frightened by these words and obediently took his seat. He liked it on the top shelf, but his feet were already flowing. He longed to walk around the carriage, to see who else was riding there, to meet someone, maybe even to run a little in the narrow corridor. But Uncle Alexander made it clear he could not, and if he disobeyed him, John didn't even want to imagine. How would it end for him? After a while, the train stopped. John looked out the window. 
At the train station, they must have arrived in some big city. Let's go for a walk, Mom suddenly suggested. Spread out a little. It's a long stop. We'll have time to get some air. Just the perfect place, said Uncle Alexander. John was very happy. Finally, at last, he would be out on the street. I wonder what kind of town this is, what kind of people are there, what kind of streets. Now everything would become clear. It's a good thing Uncle Alexander isn't going with them. John liked to take walks with his mother, just the two of them. But that hadn't happened very often lately. And now an unexpected joy. At the train station, his mother bought John a delicious marmalade pie. The boy walked along holding her hand tightly and looking around curiously. What a nice place. Passersby smiled into this little boy's eyes. The sun was shining brightly from the sky. I wish I could stay here forever. John dreamily stretched out. His mother smiled strangely. Then they went to the park. There were so many interesting swings, so many wonderful slides. John had never seen such splendor in his garden. May I? He asked his mother, looking at the brightly colored pad. Sure, Mom nodded her head. She sat down on the bench in front of me and waved. Go, go, have fun. I'll wait for you here. John rushed to the playground. He rode the merry go rounds and swing. Past the rope, the labelists. Jumped on the trampoline. There was no limit to his delight. What luck that he and his mom went out for a walk in this very wonderful city. There were a lot of children around. They were laughing, having fun, catching up with each other. John only rearranged himself one thing, and that was to another company. No one chased him away. On the contrary, the boy's arrival was welcomed, and rightly so. The more people, the merrier. Finally, John felt very tired and missed his mother, and he was hungry too. He wondered how long he had spent at the wonderful playground, and why hadn't they called him yet. It was time to go back. The boy rushed to the bench where his mother sat, but the bench was empty. On a nearby bench, two old ladies were comfortably seated, looking after their grandchildren. The next one was a man with a stroller. All the more benches next to the platform were gone. And there was no mother either. How could that be? Where is mom? What happened to her? Maybe she just went out to get some water or a pie. She'll be back now and she'll laugh at John. Why is he such a coward? Otherwise, it's just a girl and she'll tease him again. The boy nestled next to the old ladies who paid no attention to him. So engrossed, they were talking. Mom was sitting on this very bench next door. So this was where she would come back. What else could she do? Time passed. The old ladies called their grandchildren and left. The old ladies called their grandchildren and left. The other benches were empty too. There were hardly any children left on the playground. And John just sat there glued, waiting for his mother. He was cold and hungry. He was very scared. Adults were rushing by on their own errand. John tried to catch a familiar, familiar face in the crowd. But in the back of his mind, the little one began to understand that his mother would not come. Something terrible, something terrible, something unbelievable had happened. Maybe his mother was missing. Or that evil man. Alexander came and got her, but John said to leave her here. Mama always obeys him. What should we do? It's so scary, so cold, so lonely. And people don't seem as friendly as they did in the morning. And the sun no longer shines so bright and friendly. Even the playground is not happy. There's all the swings are free now. Get on any swing you want. You don't even have to stand in line. I don't feel like it at all. Suddenly the boy caught something familiar in the crowd. No, it wasn't his mother. An elderly woman who looked a lot like Granny Clava was walking slowly along the road and not so much in appearance but in facial expression. Gait, manners, tears welled up in John's eyes at that very moment. This woman could not be evil. She was like Baba Clava. She would help him in a difficult moment, tell him what to do next, support him, 
Reassure him, the boy jumped off the bench, ran up to the stranger with a kind face. He couldn't wait. What if she was about to pass by and get lost in the crowd? Hello, Auntie. The first thing John did was to say hello. Grandma Clava always said that politeness takes a city and told the little neighbor about the importance of good manners. But hello, little one. The woman looked surprised, but very kindly. Her eyes were as blue and clear as Grandma Clava's. This discovery gave John confidence. Do you happen to know where my mother is? I'm already very cold and I'm hungry, and she's still not here. Alarm flashed across the woman's face. She sat down in front of the boy so that their eyes were at the same level. Kid, are you lost? I don't know, John answered. And I don't think it's me who's lost, it's mom. I stayed where she left me and she's nowhere to be found. Anna stayed late at the clinic. Her blood pressure had been skyrocketing lately. So I had to call in from time to time. What did you want? The doctor at the doctor's office said and prescribed another round of medications and tests. Age is a given. Not a girl for a whole year as a well-deserved vacation. I cannot even believe it. Anna all her life worked as a seamstress and in a large factory in several shifts and in private enterprises and at home performed the orders. Very difficult times when she literally did not have enough for bread remained in the past. Anna still remembered the despair of those days. It was then that the incident occurred for which the woman blamed herself all her life. Sometimes it seemed that her conscience had calmed, that she had managed to convince herself that it was impossible to do otherwise. But then the guilt came back and pressed with new force. Outwardly, Anna remained calm and even cheerful. No one guessed what heavy thoughts were rolling around in her head. She and her husband rarely remembered what had happened. Anna suspected that he too was struggling hard inside himself. At least in the eyes of her husband often read a secret sadness. Of course, it is impossible to forget. It was the hard 90s. Anna was lost at work. She worked a double shift, crawling home in the evenings. Tired, exhausted legs, back and arms. The young woman literally hummed with fatigue and overexertion. Her eyes merged. They were paid literally pennies for this labor. And even that was regularly delayed. Citing the difficult economic situation. Doesn't anyone keep you here? The director used to answer everyone who was dissatisfied. Don't want to work. Write an application. There is a line for your place. You can be sure of it. And it was true. Businesses were falling apart one by one. People were left without means of livelihood. Anna understood that she couldn't find work in the city, so she endured it. She worked overtime. She went home on weekends. She was as exhausted as a lemon. And in a small apartment that she and her husband rented, a very principled old lady, her daughter was waiting, two-year-old Alice. Her husband usually had time to pick up the little girl from daycare by the time Anna returned. The man had recently lost his job. In the evenings, he worked as a jockey or unloaded trucks or helped out at a construction site. He was not closed and it was not easy to find a new place. My husband didn't even care about his qualifications. He looked for a job as an electrician. His education allowed him to work in this field. But the time was such that it was impossible to find work. So he had to make do with odd jobs. The young man's parents could not help his family. They barely survived. Anna and her husband were late children in their families. The situation was more than desperate. But Anna recalled those days with a kind of nostalgia. She and her husband were young and very much in love. Then it seemed that everything would settle down. Next to them was their adored little daughter, who daily delighted them with new achievements. And most importantly, they have not yet committed an act for which they now felt guilt. Their conscience was absolutely clear. That is why life was easier and calmer then despite the financial turmoil. Anna remembered well the day she found out she was pregnant again. She hadn't been feeling well lately, 
At first, she brushed off the alarming symptoms, attributed them not to nerves and poor nutrition. But then she did go to the doctor after work. Are you pregnant? The doctor gave his verdict after the examination. And it's 12 to 13 weeks. I'm surprised you didn't notice before. It's not the first time. Anna sat there thunderstruck. She knew, of course, that something was wrong with her body, but she attributed it to the effects of stress, hard work. The woman, without thinking twice, wanted to make an appointment for an abortion immediately. She remembered how happy she was with the news of the pregnancy. Now, Anna felt only fear. She was clearly aware that their family, which was on the verge of survival, would not be able to bear another child. Somewhere deep down in her heart, the woman wanted to become a mother again and to feel that wonderful feeling again. But now, it is impossible. What kind of interruption? The doctor asked tiredly. His face showed irritation. Did you hear the deadline, I said. It's too late, we have to give birth. Anna barely made it home. Tiny hammers were pounding in her temples, burning tears welled up in her eyes. In the soul fought all kinds of feelings, from joy, oddly enough to despair. More thoughts, they arranged in Anna's head some kind of crazy dance. Her subconscious was furiously searching for a way out of the situation, to find a find that would get rid of the fetus. It's scary, it's dangerous, to try to work from home to provide enlarging my family. Unreliable, problematic, with a big belly and then two babies in the house. Anna was so preoccupied with her thoughts that she began to cross the road at a red light. The indignant car horn brought her to her senses. It is necessary to pull herself together, to share the news with her husband. He's the man. Let him decide. Anna well remembered the look of fear and despair that appeared on her husband's face when he found out about the pregnancy. She must have looked the same way herself at the doctor's appointment. Well, the husband said uncertainly, as it turned out, we'll have the baby. What's the big deal? I think I found a job in the workshop. Well, as in the workshop, just a guy in the garage reupholstering furniture. Plus, I'll be working part-time at night. We'll make it somehow. If that's what happened, my husband hugged Anna trying to cheer her up. Then he got ready and slipped out of the house. A freight train was arriving at the station today. Loaders were needed. The woman felt a sharp pity for her husband. He was an excellent specialist, an outstanding mind. He was of no value to him. So many awards, so much respect. And now a longshoreman and an apprentice. It's a shame. And this child is for him they both have to work even harder. But there's a little Alice on the floor. Usually she could play with her toys for a long time. The woman touched her forehead. It was hot. And Anna got busy with her daughter. All other thoughts and problems receded for a while. This second unwanted pregnancy was going very hard. Anna often felt bad. Nausea, dizziness, dark spots in her eyes flashed. All this, of course, affected the work. Firing a pregnant woman is not so easy. But the director forced her to write a letter of resignation. I do not need such workers. Constant sick leave is not fulfilled. If you do not write a letter of resignation, they will sow the article on unfitness. And then you can't find a job anywhere with such a wolf's ticket. Money became even less. My husband tried very hard, of course. He worked in a furniture reupholstering shop. He took on any part-time job, but it was catastrophically insufficient to live on. And then the baby was about to arrive. Anna felt nothing for the baby who lived under her heart. Daughter, she waited with love and joy talking to her, singing songs to her. But she considered the younger child a burden and decided to spoil their lives. She scolded herself for such thoughts, but she could not help it. Only just before the birth, when it was time to prepare the baby's dowry, Anna softened a little because she was sure that this time he was expecting a son. Looking at all these tiny things, for the first time, 
the woman felt some warm feelings for the belly dweller. That was how her husband jokingly called the child. He waited impatiently for its appearance, made plans, even managed to rejoice, even though he was very tired at his work. The baby was not born on his November night. In between painful contractions, Anna could hear gusts of wind beating through the windows and cold rain drumming. Finally, the exhausted woman was placed on her chest, a writhing, screaming red creature, a boy. The midwife indifferently informed her and hurried to the other woman in labor. Anna looked at her son and could not understand her feelings. She expected, when she saw the baby, to be overwhelmed with tenderness for him. It was like that the first time. But now all the woman could think about was how to feed and raise that extra mouthful. The baby was taken away and she was sent to the ward. Anna fell asleep with pleasure. She was very tired both physically and emotionally. And in the morning there was sad news waiting for her. After the children were brought in for feeding and taken away, the doctor came into the room. She said a few words to each mother about their baby. Anna, on the other hand, asked to come into her office after half an hour. She realized that something was wrong with her baby. Otherwise, why such special attention? At the agreed time, Anna entered the office of the chief physician on her feet. Have a seat. A woman in a white coat smiled wearily, pointing to a chair in front of the table. It turned out that the newborn boy had serious heart and kidney problems and needed lifelong treatment. There are medications, but they are expensive. We have no money at all. Yes, she didn't bring up love at first sight for the newborn, but it was her son. And the news of his illness was a cruel blow. And then the expensive medications. Where would they get the money for them if they could barely make ends meet? The doctor began to say something about foundations that help families in such difficult situations. It turns out that there are sponsors in the city who support sick children, but to ask to collect documents, to knock on all the doors. There is a way out as long as you want to, assured the shocked mother, a tired woman in a white coat. It is easy for her to say she was not the one who gave birth to a sick child. And then she was discharged in the hard life where the sick newborn began. All this in the conditions of a family. Financial disaster. We decided to name my son Austin. The husband chose the name. That was the name of his great-grandfather. The great-grandfather was in excellent health. Lived almost to the age of 100. And all that time in his right mind and on his feet, the man believed that the name would help his son recover, get stronger. Anna did not object. Austin is Austin. There's no difference. She herself did not want to think about a name for the boy. The child was very restless, cried a lot, slept little, ate poorly. Alice is jealous of the mother to the new member of the family, literally fought off the hands. Constantly capricious and demanded attention to herself, Anna was going crazy from all this. But most importantly, it's health problems. They confirmed Austin in the children's polyclinic. It turned out that the case was even worse than anticipated. At first, the child required lifelong therapy with expenses medication. Part of the medications were paid for by charitable foundations, but still a large part of the family budget now went to treatment. Anna was well aware that Austin was not to blame for anything, but still almost hated this tiny tormentor for all the difficulties he caused their family. Anna did not recognize herself. She had always thought that the traits that defined her personality were kindness, mercy, compassion, wholeness. Like a woman who used to not pass quietly by a hungry kitten. Can think that way about her sick, tiny son. But feelings can't be commanded. It was only later that Anna understood and analyzed her condition at the time. Heavy pregnancy, the preceding work in several shifts, moneylessness, Serious diagnoses of a child, lack of help and prospects, all together led to a severe condition, and this is very serious and requires treatment by a specialist. But who thought about professional psychological support during those hard times? 
I would have had to survive. One way or another, a year later, it became clear the family is no longer able to pull the child, disabled neither morally, nor financially, nor physically. Anna was the first to suggest a way out. We're not doing well with Austin, she said to her husband one evening, looking him seriously in the eye. Obviously, he's getting worse. We can't even buy him medicine. We're always saving money, denying ourselves everything. I'm trying. The husband lowered his eyes. He didn't even argue. Obviously, his wife was telling the truth. You're trying. It can't go on like this. Something has to be done about it urgently. I think we should put him in an institution. They will at least provide him with medication. I found out the treatment for orphans is paid for from the budget. Orphanage. Are you suggesting that we give up our son? The husband looked at his wife. Unlike her, he clearly had warm feelings for Austin. He talked and played with him, smiled constantly. He took the boy for a ride on his back. Whenever he had a spare moment, of course that didn't happen very often. Work took up most of my time, but what was the way out? Anna went off crying. It's easy to watch him slowly fade away in front of our eyes, spending all the money on futile treatment depriving Alice all of us in starving for him. The husband did not say anything at the time, but Anna Vasilyevna saw. He thought seriously about her words. Mentally, the man knew that a seriously ill child. They really cannot now. But to decide on a desperate step was hard, very hard. In this, Anna understood him. Austin was a year old. He looked remarkably like his mother. Big blue eyes, blonde, curly, wonderful nose. Incredibly cute baby. Just a little angel from a postcard, only very skinny. Perhaps his looks will play into Austin's hands and he will have rich parents for whom the amount needed for his treatment is pennies. And he will have a happy, secure, long life. But neither they nor Austin himself will be able to afford it. It's obvious. Rented housing, no stable job. Austin is not the kind of child you can put in daycare and get out of maternity leave at age two. He needs constant attention and supervision. No employer would accept incessant sick leave. And it's also scary to think what will become of a child without the right therapy. And they could not provide him a decent treatment. So Anna saw only one way out. Her husband at first tried to take the situation under control. He found another part-time job. He stayed away from home for days and nights in the hope to provide everything the family needed. But eventually he realized that it was time to take decisive action. Anna vividly remembered the morning she and her husband arrived at the orphanage. The special institution was in a neighboring region. The spouses had arranged with the director in advance, so the family was waiting. They were met in the office by a middle-aged woman with very anxious eyes. She looked at her husband, who was reverently cradling Austin. She clarified, are you sure you have made up your mind? There will be no tantrums, tears, accusations against us. Yes, we've thought it over. We have no other option, Anna answered confidently. The baby was smiling, happy that he was going somewhere with his mother and father. He looked trustingly at Anna. It was unbearable. Okay, sighed the director. The papers are ready. Read them and sign them. The child will be taken away now. At these words, the father instinctively pulled Austin to him even tighter. Anna also reached for the baby but stopped herself. It settled. It would be better for them and her son soon. Only the adults were left in the study. Austin was taken away by a nurse. She had time to cast a disapproving glance at Anna. She endured it calmly enough. Whoever had not been in that situation had no right to blame them for anything. And then life went on as usual, so the neighbors didn't bother. Them with questions. The couple rented another apartment in a remote area. Anna got a job. Life seemed to become easier. But the thought of the children left at the orphanage, of course, could not help but torment both parents. Husband and wife tried not to talk about their deed, silently boiled in. 
their own worries. Anna gave herself many arguments every day for this decision. Austin gets the treatment she needs. They raise their eldest daughter with dignity. They don't rip her off, not with attention or material possession. The spouse isn't slaving away at several jobs at once. He looks like a human being instead of a tortured zombie. That was better for everyone. At night, the woman often could not sleep. She kept trying to imagine what it was like for Austin at the orphanage. Was he being fed well, not abused? And maybe he had long since been taken by some rich family. Her husband was worried, too. He studied nearby, without sleep, but was silent. The man tried to forget himself in his work. The furniture reupholstering workshop gradually turned into a big firm. They had to work very hard, but at the same time, he was getting paid a lot of money. Things were going well for Anna at work, too. In general, the economic situation in the country changed greatly. There was money in the family. Then the spouses could afford their own apartment, not a rented one, and they bought a car. Now they went to the sea every summer, something they had never dreamed of before. Sometimes Anna thought about what if Austin had come into the world. They wouldn't have thought about putting him in an orphanage. Now they could buy their son all the medicine he needed and even perform an expensive operation. Apparently, the same thoughts visited the husband. Because one day, when Alice was already sound asleep in her room, he decided to have a serious conversation. How old is our son now? Ten years old. It's almost eleven. The woman answered quietly, in all the time since the visit to the orphanage. The couple rarely dared to talk about the boy. Alice had no memory of ever having had a brother. Here's what I'm thinking. Maybe we could take him away. Yes, I think about it all the time. But I'm afraid he'll forgive us. Will he understand? Maybe he was adopted a long time ago. You mean you don't mind? There was a look of joyful relief on the man's face. I've been thinking about it for a long time. I just didn't know how to talk to you. Of course I don't mind. I've been tormented by a wild feeling of guilt all these years. Finally, the woman confessed her feelings and immediately felt relieved, as if some of the burden had been lifted from her soul. Alice, how should I tell her about it? Let's say it tomorrow. Let's just find the right words. She doesn't know how she'll react either. Anna thought about it. Did Alice often ask her parents for a brother or sister? But after all they had been through, the couple could not even think of having another child. And now, being at such a tender age, their daughter suddenly learns about the terrible act of mom and dad. How will she take it? It is frightening to even imagine. Let's not tell her anything yet, Anna decided. Let's go to the orphanage first, see what's going on. We'll meet Austin. And then we'll see. We didn't postpone the trip. It was the coming weekend. The couple got in the car and drove to the next region. On the same road as ten years ago, the daughter was told that they were going to visit her father's friend. The orphanage has not changed at all over these years, except that more swings and slides appeared in the yard. The director was still the same woman who would talk to the confused spouses. Then, on that terrible day, dividing her life into before and after, she immediately recognized them. I remember you, the woman said as she looked at the visitors. Were you the one who left the boy here? That was about ten years ago. I guess your story is not typical. That's why I remember it. Usually children from disadvantaged families come to us. Are cases like yours rare? We'd like to pick up our son. Anna got right to the point. That's how. There was a look of confusion on the director's face. Back then we were living below the poverty line, my husband explained. We couldn't provide for the children properly and Austin needed treatment. That's why we did it, and now everything's better. So you thought the orphanage was a kind of a halfway house for the baby. It's a bad situation. Gave it up to the state. Then you changed your mind and just took it away. The director didn't hide her irritation. You shouldn't judge us without being in our shoes, Anna warned. She had a lot more to say to this haughty woman, but she didn't want to anger her. 
They were all too dependent on the director of the orphanage by now. It was foolish to turn her against herself. You won't be able to get your son back. We don't have him anymore. And where? Anna jumped up on the spot. Where is Austin now? I can't tell you that, the principal answered dryly. Now, if you would be so kind as to leave my office, why won't you tell me? Is this an adoption secret? At least give me a hint. The father, who was sure he was going to leave the orphanage with his son, wouldn't let up. Leave the room, the woman repeated in an icy tone. Otherwise, I'll have to call security. First they abandon the child, then they ask for him back. There's nothing to be done. The couple left the office with nothing. A nurse came up to them on the porch, a full elderly woman with kind, sad eyes and a surprising wrinkle on that face. Are you Austin's parents? She asked, looking sympathetically at the confused visitors. You left him here because you couldn't afford to treat or feed him. Yes, that's us. We are the scoundrels, the man replied. Why scoundrels don't listen to our principal? She is a bad person. Do you know anything about Austin? Anna looked at him hopefully. I know, of course. It's sad, the old woman sighed. The little boy is his mother. Same blue eyes, same blue eyes, same blonde hair. That's how handsome he looks. What about him? Where is he, Pip? I have nothing to offer you, the nurse lowered her eyes. He's dead. Four years ago, his heart gave out. He couldn't make it to the hospital. So the expensive medicine didn't help. The ground fell from under Anna's feet. The woman staggered. She almost fell. She went pale. Her husband barely managed to hold her by the shoulders. Thought that it is better to know you the truth. The nurse continued her speech. It is parents after all. Otherwise, they would have started a search, hired some detectives. We would have hoped for years, and then we would have found out anyway. Thank you for the truth, Anna forced herself out. It really is better this way. How can I live now? I understand, the old woman agreed heavily. But you have to live. Nothing is your fault. The boy was sick without treatment. It would have happened earlier in your family. He was always well off here. Everybody loved him. The boy was very kind, affectionate, and clever, too. All the way home, the couple was silent. Anna understood that the nurse was right. Austin was doomed from birth, but she could not help but blame herself for chickening out. Then her son would have lived a shorter life, but surrounded by loving relatives, not strangers. The woman knew this guilt would stay with her. Forever. And nothing could atone for it. Of course, the couple did not tell Alice anything. Austin remained a great mystery even to each other. The couple never spoke again about their son or his fate. It was too scary, too hard. But the parents, of course, could not stop thinking about him. Not a day went by that Anna did not think of her little boy. She secretly prayed for him, put candles in church and fed him. She constantly fed herself for her cowardice. The realization that nothing could be changed now weighed heavily on her. To her own surprise, Anna gradually got used to this life. Guilt became part of her personality, without which the woman could no longer imagine herself. Her daughter grew up and went to study in the capital, then got a job there. She settled in the capital. She wasn't around anymore, which impressed her parents. But at the same time, they were proud of Alice's achievements and were ready to put up with her departure, just so their girl would be happy. Anna Vasilyevna recently retired. Her husband was still working. The workshop in the garage turned into a large furniture factory. And Anna's husband was the head of the department there. A big man, solid salaries, he liked his job. The woman suspected that work allowed her husband to distract himself from sad thoughts. Anna finally plunged headlong into the household. All her life she had worked. There wasn't enough time to spend at home, but now their apartment was in perfect order. The table was full of culinary masterpieces. It turned out that taking care of their relatives was a pleasant pastime, not a drudgery, as they had imagined before. True, there were not enough people to take care of now, 
only her husband, and the unpretentious cat Barsik. But Anna was still happy. She dreamed of grandchildren, whom her daughter would bring to grandmother and grandfather on vacations already on them. Alice's children, Anna would have a blast. The only thing that overshadowed, a woman's measured life not counting, of course the usual thoughts about Austin. Shake her health, so now Anna was on her way back from the outpatient clinic. She purposely chose the road through the park. She liked it beautiful, crowded, spacious, and so many swings for children. That's where she would bring her grandchildren. I can't wait. Anna even smiled at her dreams. Oh, a granddaughter. She suddenly had a clear image of a boy and a girl, twins and a sweet reverie. The woman was pulled out by a pitiful and thin voice. Anna was being rubbed by the sleeve of her coat by a tiny boy. He looked no more than three or four years old, eyes wide open blue, twisted nose, blonde curls. A real little angel from the picture, only very thin child surprisingly resembled Austin. Anna last saw her son when he was a year old, but no doubt. At three or four, he looked exactly like this baby. Her heart clenched painfully. The woman had to take a deep breath to come to her senses. The child spoke again and his words forced. Anna perked up. The boy clearly needed help. I was cold and hungry and my mom was still gone. Tiny looked confused and frightened. He looked at Anna with eyes full of hope. The woman firmly took him by the hand and together they slowly, several times, walked around the park in search of the baby's mother. The boy, who introduced himself as John, stroked around diligently, but he never saw his mother. Where do you live? Anna tried to find out. But John was too young to give the exact address. From his confused explanations, the woman understood that the boy with his mother and some uncle Alexandra took a long train ride. Then they went for a walk. The little boy was playing in the playground, and then he found out that his mother was gone, and now he was afraid that something had happened to her. Let's go to the train station. Anna decided, maybe your mom put out an ad. The woman firmly holding the baby's hand looked for the staff box. A man in uniform assured her that today there was no announcement about a missing child. No one was run over by a train and the whole day passed surprisingly quietly and peacefully. And what to do with it now? Confused, Anna asked, pointing her eyes at the frightened and tired baby. What to do? What to do to the police and children? replied the officer on duty. At the station there are often street kids hanging out, the offspring of dysfunctional families, runaways and orphans. He certainly didn't run away from the orphanage, answered Anna angrily. She was annoyed by the indifference of the officer on duty. The woman called a cab and went with the baby to the police station. The baby on the way sweetly dozed off, trustfully laying his heavy half on her lap. Laying his heavy half on her lap, nah. Vasilyevna stroked the boy's blonde curls and wondered for the umpteenth time. The resemblance was found on that one. And maybe it is not by chance. Maybe fate had sent them a chance to redeem themselves in their old age. John was abandoned. That's obvious. Brought from somewhere far away. Left in a playground in an unfamiliar city. Anna didn't even judge his parents. I mean, what kind of situations do people have in life? True, of course, the baby's mother acted inconsiderately. Abandoning her son in danger. You never know who would have found the child. Bad people. Stray dogs possibly confused, desperate. The woman just didn't think about it. Anna Vasilyevna was sure that Tolka's extreme need and desperation could have driven Mother Jonah to take such a step. One way or another, no one wants the baby. Most likely, an orphanage awaits him. So maybe take him in the family, become parents to him with her husband. Or a grandmother or grandfather. Her husband wouldn't mind the boy was taken to the children's hospital for an examination. 
after which the boy waited at boarding school and his mother was put on the wanted list. Anna, at home, I told my husband all about the foundlings. The next weekend they went together to visit the baby in the hospital. John was genuinely happy to see a familiar face and hugged Anna as if she were his own. Businesslike, he shook hands with her husband. John turned out to be talkative. He told his visitors about his hospital routine. He asked a thousand questions about the world, shared observations about doctors and other adults around him. Anna fell more and more in love with this unintelligent child and saw that the same thing was happening to her spouse. When it was time to part ways, John hugged them tightly and did not want to let go. Tears came to the baby's eyes. You're so good and kind. I'm going to miss you like Baba Clava. Is that your grandmother? Anna grasped at the thin thread. Perhaps there is a relative on this earth who cares about him. Our neighbor, John answered. Anna sighed sadly. Just a neighbor. Since then, Anna, her husband, often visited John. First at the hospital, then at the orphanage, where the boy was transferred after his examination. The woman repeatedly asked the heads of the orphanage to give her custody of the baby. Anna imagined how good it would be for John in their apartment. They would surround the baby with care and love. They would walk with him, feed him, snowball him, read him interesting books. But while the investigation was going on, that was out of the question. And then John's mother did turn up. She was found in a town by the sea, where she decided to start a new life. A young graduate of an orphanage, Olivia enjoyed the freedom and the splendor of the sea. She didn't need a child. She easily left him in the park near the train station. That's what her roommate Alexander advised her to do. The man was twice Olivia's age. The experienced father of many children told her that if she gave John to his mother in the orphanage, she would have to pay her son alimony until she came of age. How many of them are there, lost all over the country? Olivia and Alexander even issued a missing child report. It is true they staged the loss of the baby at the station, which is almost 1,000 kilometers from where they left John. Olivia got a real sentence for leaving the child in danger. She was sent to a women's colony. That's where she wrote a formal abandonment of her unwanted son. Now at least John has the status of an orphan. Alexander, on the other hand, got off with a minor scare. What seemed unfair to Anna. After all, it was he who had persuaded Olivia to commit the terrible deed. But for some reason, the man was not charged with complicity in the crime. Anna and her husband did not think long about the serious step. Both had long and sincerely loved John and were glad to accept him into their family. They talked about their plans about adoption with their daughter. She was surprised, of course, but had nothing against the little half-brother. She even seemed happy. However, the couple was denied custody. What do you need such a small child for? The woman with glasses interjected, looking pityingly at the visitors. Not the right age, and we don't have health either. The right to give it to you because of the age, though you have all the conditions for raising a baby, it seems, Anna and her. Husband returned home that day upset. They had already made plans about how to equip a nursery and in what circles to enroll the imaginary boy. And then there was this. Now what to do, how to tell John that they wouldn't take him home like they'd promised? And why did they only give the little boy hope early on? Why didn't they go to the foster home first? That was, of course, very foolish of them. The couple continued to visit John at the orphanage. They brought gifts, sweets, walked around the grounds with the boy. The baby had become completely family to them. How to give up John? How to give up John? How to give up John? Stop thinking about him. I need to talk to Olivia. One day, Anna told her husband, Here's how. What do you need that for? The man was surprised. Perhaps she will write some kind of statement saying that she is giving the child to us. John is nobody to her. The man reminded her. She gave up on him and has no right to make any decisions about him. But maybe I'll learn something important from her. I want to help John, you know? 
When I think of all the boys in orphanages all their lives, do I have to? I understand. I'm hurting for him myself. But I don't know how your meeting with his bio-mother can help. I, on the other hand, feel like I need to see you. The case is yours. Anna found out in which city the colony where John's mother was serving time was located. It wasn't close. It took the woman two days to get there by train. It was the first time Anna had been in such a bleak place. The sullen staff, the gray walls. Yes, the atmosphere. It was even hard to breathe in here. A silent woman in a blue camouflage uniform. After a thorough inspection, she escorted the visitor into the visiting room. The room resembled a living room in an ordinary apartment. A couch, two armchairs, a nightstand with a television, a rug on the floor. Soon Olivia was brought in. She turned out to be a very young girl. She looked even younger than Alice. Thin, dark-haired, with evil black eyes. Who are you? She asked cautiously. I do not know you. Anna introduced herself and told how she had found a frightened baby in the park. So you're the reason I'm here, Olivia smirked. If not me, then others would have found it, the woman rightly remarked. There were gypsies wandering around. I hoped they would take him with them, and they needed the little ones to beg. Especially since John is good-looking, they give more to such people. Anna felt her anger boil in her soul against this unscrupulous girl who wanted such a fate for her son. And how could an unprincipled, selfish mother have such a wonderful baby like John? Could the boy have taken after his father? He certainly didn't look anything like his mother on the outside. Where is John's real father? Anna asked. She suppressed her irritation by force of will and continued her conversation with Olivia in a calm, even tone. John's fate depends on this girl right now. You mustn't make her angry. Olivia's father lives somewhere. He got married and I think he had a daughter. He swore his love for me, begged me to go back to the walls, begged me to let him talk to me. Tell me more, please. Did Anna suddenly get her hopes up? This is unlikely. But what if Father John is a normal man who would be glad to have such a son and take him into his family from the orphanage? What's there to tell? Olivia muttered. And suddenly she perked up. Okay, I'll tell you everything, but not for nothing. How much? Anna asked. Well, the girl wondered about the amount. She clearly didn't want to get any cheaper. Not to scare off a visitor. Too high a rate. One thousand dollars, I think it will be enough. Anna tried to hide her relief so as not to whet Olivia's appetite. Okay, as if grudgingly she agreed. The woman took half the money out of her purse and handed it to the girl. The rest is after. Okay, immediately Olivia was choked up. The story isn't original, but it's a long one. So, as they say, make yourselves comfortable and listen. Olivia grew up in an orphanage. Her childhood was difficult. Hunger, angry teachers, humiliation, even beatings. Anna, to herself, wondered how this girl, having gone through such torments, could deliberately condemn her own child to them. One way or another, Olivia grew up. She was given an apartment in her marriage, some living space of her own. Olivia rejoiced at her long-awaited freedom and her own place. The truth was that no one called her to dine in the dining room on the first floor anymore. She had to earn her own living. And Olivia didn't like to work. The young, pretty orphanage graduate quickly figured out how not to starve to death without slaving away at her job. She learned to exist at the expense of admirers, the lack of which was not observed. One day, Olivia met Charles, a former classmate of hers from college, where she was once forced to study by the administration of the orphanage. The blue-eyed, modest blonde was in love with her, and Olivia was well aware of this, but did not dare to admit it, and the girl also deliberately amused herself. She drove the guy in the paint with unexpected phrases and requests, 
and so they accidentally ran into each other in the park. Charles looked much better than he had in college, more mature, more confident. It turned out that he still had feelings for Olivia. It was strange, but very pleasant. Olivia took the guy in stride. They started dating. Charles felt perfectly happy. He even proposed to the Lady of the Heart. But there was one significant disadvantage for the boys. The strict parents who controlled their son's life, of course, would not be against such a daughter-in-law. And even if the wedding had taken place, Charles's mom and dad would be constantly watching Olivia's every move. And then the carefree revelry, romantic meetings, and the like pleasant things would have to be forgotten. And Charles himself is good-looking, of course, reliable, but he's already very proper and boring. Becoming his wife means once and for all to devote itself to the family, the household, housekeeping. Oh no, that's definitely not for Olivia. At least not yet. So the girl turned down the offer, roughly rejected the guy she was in love with. A couple weeks later, she realizes she's pregnant, and it's definitely Charles. At first, she wanted to have an abortion, but she inexperiencedly missed the deadline, and the hospital rejected her. What to do? No money, no job. Besides, she did not want to work hard. A new friend advised her to give birth. I did not miss my chance, instructed the wise woman by experience. If you give birth, you will receive benefits from the state. And from the father, you'll get money until the baby is 18. Olivia thought about it. Yes, the prospects were really quite good. True. Then the young mother. To be had no idea what her child was. It wasn't a doll that lay where you left it. Olivia realized that motherhood was a punishment. Hard work, very quickly. The boy was born healthy, calm, according to those around him. But he turned his young mother's life into a nightmare. Constantly crying, demanding food attention. It was unbearable. Charles at first helped only with money. Olivia did not allow him to see the baby. She herself could not explain why. Just out of spite, probably liked to feel his power, his mightiness. But then, when the baby finally shook Olivia, she still needed the physical help of Charles. Young Daddy was happy to communicate with the baby, adopted him, walked with him outside. And Olivia, in the meantime, could at least get some rest. Then Charles began to take John away with sleepovers. The boy already lived apart from his parents, so their consent or prohibition didn't matter to him. Officially, Charles was nobody to the baby. On the birth certificate, John was listed as the father. Olivia asked for a dash in order to receive welfare. But it was actually Charles who raised the baby from six months to about two, five years old. He worked remotely, so he managed to combine work and raising his son. Olivia, on the other hand, lived the life she had always dreamed of. Entertainment, noisy companies, romantic meetings, adding color to the gray of everyday life, drinking. The money was there. The state paid a regular allowance for the child, who was in fact raised and fed by Charles. Admirers did not skimp on drinks and snacks. Everything was working out just fine. Olivia considered it a reward of fate for the hard years in the orphanage. One day, Child welfare came to Olivia's apartment right in the middle of the fun. It appeared that Charles had decided to register John officially for himself. He planned to make a DNA test to confirm paternity and to deprive Olivia of parental rights. Believed that it was dangerous for a child to be around such a mother. The girl couldn't let that happen. After all, then goodbye to the allowance. She gave Sergei a huge scandal, took her son away and forbade the guys to be around them. Otherwise, I'll report him to the police. You, John, are nobody, a stranger's uncle. Let them find out how you got the baby. They'll charge you and they'll put you away. Olivia was falling apart. How to communicate with a child's unhappy father. She was taught by older friends. You have to transfer money to support him. If you're the father, even if it's unofficial. If you have a conscience, you'll help. 
but I won't let you see him anymore. Charles tried to reconcile. It was clear that he was attached to the boy and truly loves him, but Olivia remained unapproachable. She didn't want the big trouble that she could expect from Charles. John had grown up. He was already much less of a problem and hassle. He could even be let out alone in the yard for a few hours. Let him walk around, get some fresh air, breathe healthy air. The neighbors, however, scolded. They say, negligent mother, if they leave such a baby unattended, but their opinion Olivia little interested. A year and a half had passed. John had almost forgotten Charles. He had no more reminders of himself either. He didn't remind him of himself anymore either. One day Olivia heard from a mutual friend that Charles got married and the young family was expecting a new addition. The girl suddenly realized that she was saddened by this news. Her own reaction really surprised Olivia. She had not thought that Charles' personal life had any importance for her. And yet the girl had long been convinced that Charles loved her and John, that he would do anything for them. You could see the ropes out of the guy, manipulate him, play on his feelings. And then all of a sudden, it's like this. Okay, now what? Olivia had another great love in her life to Alexander for her age. But a strong, confident man who knows how to live his life. And with a lot of money, too. You can't go wrong with him. It's true, though, that John was a nuisance to the grown-ups. He had to be fed, clothed, clothed, and occasionally taken to the clinic. He asked 1,000 questions a minute and demanded constant attention. A lot of money was spent on him. A lot of money was spent on him. Alexander offered to get rid of the boy, and the occasion was right. The couple decided to move permanently to a city by the sea. Alexander had some friends or relatives there. It's a long, long way. The little boy might well get lost somewhere along the way. Olivia didn't mind. Early motherhood and the need to take care of her son irritated her. Of course, she could give him to Charles, but then he would have won. And Alexander advised her to stay as his mother. We'd accumulate alimony debts, and then we'd never get it paid. That was not the fate Olivia wanted, so she did not give the boy to the orphanage. After all, if she was officially registered, all her data would remain in the database and she would have to transfer money to support John until he was 18 years old. No thanks. She liked Alexandra's plan better. Leave John at a train station in one town, then report him missing at a completely different station, and then no one would find the end. What kind of wise decision was that then? Olivia was sure the plan would work. But in the end, it didn't turn out the way Alexander and Olivia had hoped. The negligent mother was tracked down after all. And now here she is, in the colony, serving her sentence for leaving a small child in danger. She and Alexander did not foresee this. And he turned out to be a jerk. Olivia grumbled angrily. Alexander, when they nailed us, blamed it on me. He got away clean. But that's okay. I'll get out of here. I want that bastard back. Thank you for the revelations. Anna thanked me after listening to Olivia. You do have a difficult fate. And yet you have an apartment, don't you? You could have a job. It's easy now. My father helped support the baby. I can't understand how you could refuse such a miracle. But you can have this miracle too. If you are so good, Olivia replied, irritated. Not so good. Anna shook her head. I've made mistakes in my time, too. They won't let me have John. They say I'm too old to be a mother to such a baby, so let him live in an orphanage. I grew up there, and that's okay. Anna said goodbye to Olivia and left the building. A plan to save John was already forming in her head. If she got it right, the boy's father is a good, decent man. Anna knows his name, knows the town where he lives, knows the approximate age and the place where John's father went to school with Olivia. It probably won't be hard to find the man. And then, 
from there on, it will have to be a matter of circumstance. But that she had to find Charles, Anna was absolutely sure. Back home, the woman actively began her search. She began by monitoring social networks. She checked everyone, both friends of Olivia and her friends, and her friends too. There were a lot of Charles among them, but no one fit the description. So the woman placed an ad in a local news group, briefly describing the situation. This step gave me the desired result. Anna began to get calls from jokers who thought it was a lot of fun. To introduce herself as Charles and make the caller believe a delusional legend. At first, the woman answered each caller hopefully. It seemed to her that Father John was finally found, and so the boy was saved. But soon Anna was scolding herself for the rash act. The calls came sometimes at the most inopportune moment. They interrupted important business, made her nervous and desperate. The woman shared the problem with her daughter when she called to cope. How are your parents doing, Mom? Why didn't you consult with me? I didn't want to distract you. You've got enough on your plate as it is. I thought I could do it myself. Delete the ad before you're completely bombarded with calls. We need to hire a private investigator. I'll take care of it. It's expensive, isn't it? Probably not the way you think, but it's reliable. But there was no need to turn to detectives because Charles called himself. That same evening, Anna had just deleted the ad when another call came. I'm about your message in the news chat room of our city. A quiet male voice sounded in the tube. Anna thought it was someone else calling to have fun again. She was used to it over the past few days, so she answered dryly and discreetly. I'm listening to you carefully. I think it's about my son. My name is Charles. His name is John. The baby's mother wouldn't let us see her. They disappeared out of town a while ago. So everything kind of fits together. What is the boy's mother's name? Anna had a control question prepared to judge the curious and the jokers. Olivia. Her name is Olivia. Please tell me quickly, is John okay? It looks like it's really you, the woman concluded. Answer a few more questions so I can be sure. Because you know I've been getting a lot of hilarious phone calls about this lately. I even had to delete the ad. Of course, I want to know if it's my boy myself. Okay. What does the baby look like? How old is he now? Describe your son's appearance. John is almost four years old. He has big blue eyes, blonde hair, and a snub nose. He is smart, out of his age. He catches everything at once. He likes strawberries and ice cream, loves animals and ice cream, loves animals and asks questions all the time. John is very inquisitive. He is also... That's enough, I understand, Anna smiled. You know your son very well, and you seem to really love him. So where is John now? I take it Olivia is not with him. There's nothing wrong with the boy. John really needs help right now, the woman answered. He's had an unpleasant, scary story. He's in the orphanage now. He's a beautiful boy. I wanted to take him for myself, but the foster care did not approve. They said I was too old to adopt, and I really wanted to help him, so I tracked you. Down. You can't imagine how grateful I am. Charles's voice trembled excitedly. I'll be leaving for your city shortly. Write down my address, Anna suggested. I think we should meet and talk about many things. Besides, it would be good if we came together to see the boy. He has forgotten you, of course. He was just a baby at the time you were looking after him, wasn't he? He's used to me, though. He trusts me, though. He trusts me. Let's go to John together. Wow. Charles was surprised. So you know even those details. I actually took care of the baby myself for about six months. Olivia wasn't busy with him. I went to see Olivia, talked to her. Wouldn't she have reached out to you otherwise? Anna really wanted to see Charles before he went to John. It was important to her to make sure that he was a reliable and decent man with whom the boy would be happy. So she went to meet the man at the train station. Anna recognized Charles immediately. The young man looked remarkably like John Jaw. Or rather, it was the boy who looked like his father. 
Alexander had not arrived alone. In his arms sat a little girl. She didn't look more than a year old. She must have been John's little sister. She was as blue-eyed and blonde as her brother. Beside the man hurriedly stepped trying to keep up with her husband, a pretty young woman. Anna hurried to meet this beautiful family, even from a distance. When she noticed the young people, she knew that John would soon be in good hands. If only they would give him to his father. With him, the boy would be happy. How fortunate that they were found. Thank you so much for not abandoning your son, for finding us. Charles looked at Anna, smiled broadly, and then introduced his charming companions. This is Julia, my wife, and the baby's name is Milana. She's our daughter, but they didn't go to the orphanage right away. They had to wait for visiting hours. Anna helped the family get settled in a local hotel. The woman offered to stay with her. Her husband and she herself would have been only too happy to have such wonderful company. But Julia flatly refused to embarrass her hosts. You've done so much for our family, she told Anna. I always dreamed that we would have many children and that we would have an older boy. It seems this wish will soon come true. You'll like John very much, Anna smiled. Her chest felt warm, warm at that. He's a wonderful little fellow. How I've missed him all this time, Charles admitted. Finally, it was visiting time. The entire private company with Anna at the head sat and waited for John to be brought out. The staff was already aware of the situation. Some could not hold back tears. When they found out that the baby had a loving father, they were ready to take him into their family. It was just a matter of paperwork. In order to get John to Charles, a whole pile of papers had to be assembled. Dangerous for him to stay with his mother. Tried to. Charles answered, his eyes downcast sadly. But I was practically a stranger's uncle to him. And in order to do a DNA test, you need the consent of a legal representative. I mean, Olivia, as you can imagine, she didn't give consent, of course. She needed John as a source of income. Julia got involved. There are a lot of mothers like that now, living on welfare. And then a rich man came along, as she understood it. The need for benefits disappeared and the child got in the way. Well, here is the result. It's good that everything turned out so well. It could have been much worse. I can't even begin to imagine the dangers faced by a baby who was abandoned in an unfamiliar city, in a park near the train station. The young woman's voice trembled. Tears welled up in her eyes. Tears flowed, which Julia struggled to contain. Clearly, she had taken John's situation to heart. Julia would be a wonderful mother to the baby. Loving, caring, understanding. You're a guardian angel, John. Charles smiled, looking at Anna. I have a baby myself. Julia stroked her daughter's hair, who touched herself sweetly on her mother's lap while waiting for her big brother. And I don't understand. I just don't understand how you can do this to a baby. Anna silently shook her head. She was in complete agreement with Katya. More than once, the woman had tried to find excuses for Olivia, the poor orphan girl who had not received parental love and care in her time, but her imagination was lacking. I guess there's just such a breed of people, selfish, dishonest, unscrupulous, and there's nothing you can do about it. John is very lucky to have Charlie's East Julia in his life now. There couldn't be better parents for a sensible boy. The door finally swung open. As if on cue, the adults turned their heads toward her. On the threshold stood a teacher, an elderly, slightly overweight woman in a white coat. She kindly smiled at those present and said hello to everyone. The caregiver held by her hand his little John with huge blue eyes. The baby had been prepared for this meeting. He smiled affectionately at Anna and stared with interest at the people she had brought with her to the orphanages. Well, John, these are the guests I told you about. The kindergarten teacher said to the child, Come and meet them. 
The boy ran up to the adults and looked cheerfully at Julia and Charles. They were smiling at the charming boy. These are my new friends. Really, John clarified. It's great that you're finally here. I've been waiting for you. At this point, Charles E. Julia, in spite of the warnings from Anna and the staff at the orphanage, could not hold back their emotion. They hugged the boy from both sides, enclosing him in a cocoon of caring arms. The boy stood, surprised, flapping his eyes and smiling. Then, when the emotions had subsided a little, a more engaging conversation began. John, as usual, bombarded visitors with questions. He was interested in his future about the city where he was going to live. He wanted to know what kind of room he would have. John also stated that he simply admired Milana and offered his help to Charles and Julia in raising her. It was important to let him know that he already had experience in an orphanage. He was the only one who knew how to play properly with the youngest foster children. The little girl was clearly attracted to the cheerful, energetic kid, too. She smiled at John with a toothless smile and pulled her hands over his knee. The two hours allotted for the visit flew by unnoticed. Anna's heart sang at the sight of this wonderful picture. It turned out even better than if she had been allowed to take John from the orphanage. Yes, she became very attached to the baby. But now he will have young parents and a little sister, and most importantly, a birth father of his own. No one would replace him. The streets were decorated with garlands and themed figures. Store windows were lured out with advertisements for winter discounts. Anna decided not to take a cab, but to walk to Charles's house on foot. Her bags were not heavy. She didn't take many things. She only came for a couple of days. Gifts for all the members of the wonderful family pleasantly pulled her hands with their weight. With what pleasure did she choose it all? After that first meeting at the orphanage, John didn't stay long within the walls of the institution. Knowing Charles' unusual history, everyone was on his side. The administration, the child welfare authorities, and the orphanage staff. The DNA test was ready in a very short time and confirmed the obvious. John really turned out to be Charles's son. The rest of the paperwork came together quickly, too. Then a psychologist worked with John, explaining that the baby would now live with his family, that Charles and Julia were his parents. Charles, as his father, the boy quickly accepted. But Julia, he called an aunt for a long time, although he was attached to her wholeheartedly. The woman gave the boy a lot of attention, love, and affection. With her, he literally blossomed, became calm and more confident. But still, the baby still remembered his own mother and Olivia and loved her in spite of everything. Julia did not rush the child, was sympathetic to his choice. And then, just the other day, a real New Year's Eve miracle happened. John spoke to Julia for the first time with the long-awaited word, Mother. It made me feel so warm, so easy. Julia shared her joy with Anna. They were now often talking on the phone. Of course, Anna kept in touch with these nice people. John brought them together, tied them by an invisible connecting thread. The elderly woman was grateful to fate for meeting Charles and Julia. Now she had true friends in her life. Yes, they became friends, despite the solid difference in age. They were easy and fun together. Anna regretted that John's family lived so far away, in another city. And Charles and Julia seemed to miss her too, because they constantly called her to visit. And so Anna finally got ready, bought presents, got on the train, and came to the holiday itself. She will not stay here. She will return home. Daughter Alice promised to visit her parents on New Year's Eve and hinted that she would not be alone. She'll probably meet her fiancé's son, and then the grandchildren won't be far behind. Soon, very soon, babies will appear in Anna's life, in addition to those who have already become relatives. Snow and calls grew under her feet and beautiful and disappeared in the light of street lamp. Here is the right house already. There they are waiting for her. 
John rushing in, hugging her. And of course, immediately he asks her a lot of questions. He'll probably ask about the train, about the road. Anna was welcomed warmly. The set table waited in the living room. From the kitchen came the aroma and taste of the lowest pastries. The evening was warm, cordial, and cheerful. Anna enjoyed chatting with Charles and Julia, listening to new and funny stories about the babies. Yes, life with such babies just can't be boring. The young parents looked a little tired, but very happy. John made our family complete, Julia said. He made me realize that this was exactly the kind of boy we needed. Charles looked at his wife with tenderness and love. It was obvious he was grateful for her attitude toward his son. Yes, indeed, a lucky man indeed. People like Julia are rare after all. And then Anna played with John and Milana, building towers out of cubes, having tea parties for the dolls. She took the children for a long ride on the home swing, enjoying their bay of pure laughter. And before going to bed, she read the little ones a fairy tale. Both were catching every word. With interest, even tiny Milana. She was at a strong age now, trying to repeat everything after her brother like a little monkey. Then Anna lay on the sofa in the guest room assigned to her and smiled. The housemates, tired from the troubles and impressions of the day, slept. The wall clock in the apartment was flowing. Anna was used to being tormented by thoughts of Austin before she went to sleep. She tried to imagine his life in an orphanage without parental love, affection. She wondered if her son had been hurt by his caretakers or by the inmates. It was a terrible burden. It did not allow me to rejoice. Now, for some reason, it became easier. The memories of the terrible mistake were no longer so heartbreaking. John had somehow miraculously healed the old wounds. No, Anna did not absolve herself of guilt. Her heart still ached. Pity for her son, who had suffered such a difficult fate. Poor, abandoned, sick boy. But the woman finally decided to tell her daughter. She, of course, was shocked. For some time, Alice just silently clapped her eyes and tried to catch air in her mouth. So stunned, she suddenly discovered the secret. But her daughter did not turn away from her parents. How had Anna imagined all these years? On the contrary, she pitied them, accepted this terrible choice, even supported them. How do you live with such a heavy burden on your soul? Alice whispered, hugging her mother and father. But you were young, confused, scared. No one supported my poor you. Yes, the tragedy of Austin will forever remain with Anna. But life is so much easier now. She had a chance to save a child. How amazingly similar to her son. And she did. Now John is with a loving family and there is joy and serenity in Anna's soul.